presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. I am the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the whistler's strange story. She wanted too much. Ruth Walker looked beautiful standing there by the window. Part of it was because Ruth knew how to look beautiful. And more important, when to look beautiful. Yes, you realized the importance of your appearance when you were very young, didn't you, Ruth? And now, at this rather late hour, your employer, Charles Burton, seems especially susceptible to your wistful, seemingly innocent beauty. And as Charles smiles at you, and you smile in return, the relationship of employer and secretary seems to change. Here at your apartment, Charles seems to forget his jewelry store, his troubles at home, everything but his immediate surroundings. I think you'll find it just right, Charles. Thanks, Ruth. I'm sure I will. Everything you do is just right. <laughs> you know, if you keep saying that, you might convince me, and then I'd be unbearable, darling. Here, drink your thing. Thanks. Good? Oh, perfect. <laughs> All right, Ruth. What day is it? Exactly five months ago, I walked into your jewelry store, asked for a job. There wasn't any until... Until I walked in and saw... And, and then there was. <laughs> Five months ago today. Hmm? Yes, Charles, it's all been wonderful. Only one thing missing. For me, anyway. Yes? Not having you always, darling. 365 days a year. Ruth? I thought we'd agreed not to discuss that. I, I'm sorry, it's just that I... Let's not spoil what we have, Ruth. There's no change, nothing holding either of us. Except that I've fallen in love with you. You'll get over it when you meet some nice young man. I won't. I don't even want to, ever. I'm still married, Ruth. My wife isn't well. I couldn't leave her after 20 years. The shock would be too much. I've asked nothing of you except the pleasure of your company from time to time. If you'd rather not see me anymore... Oh, please, Charles, I... I'm sorry I shouldn't have said anything. No, Ruth, you really shouldn't have. I wish you hadn't. Well, Ruth, even after five months, you're moving too fast, aren't you? Charles Burton, your employer and friend, is still cautious, on guard. You're not even sure that you haven't spoiled your original plan. You're still wondering about it after Charles leaves, when... Fred, you shouldn't have come here like this. Easy, baby. I saw him leave. Close the door when I talk to you. It's late. Ah, relax. Sit down. All right, Fred, what's bothering you? When do we go to work on your boyfriend? You got enough on him right now for me to approach him? We have nothing on him so far. He's simply been friendly and kind. He's given you quite a few expensive doodads, hasn't he? Oh. He's been up here plenty of times. That's enough for me. Besides, you can always exaggerate a little. You have before. Now, when do I go to see him and threaten to tell his wife? I'll tell you when. You told me that three months ago. Hey, you wouldn't have something else in your mind, would you? Like what? Like deciding to sell Mr. Bacon, getting a divorce, and marrying him? Cutting me out of the deal? <laughs> That's ridiculous. He's old enough to be my father. That don't bother a lot of women. I'm as anxious for some of the burden money as you are. All right, then figure out something. Well, I, I think I have. But it'll take a little nerve. I don't like the blackmail idea, Fred. It's too risky. Charles might not go for it either. You thought of a better idea? I think so. You can hold him up. Hold him up? Your boss? Yes, it'll be easy, Fred. Oh, you're out of your mind. Besides, I'm not interested in small change. You call 20 or 30,000 small change? Are you telling me he carries... Listen, Fred, tomorrow night, Charles is taking some diamond rings and bracelets to the Blue Hills Hotel to show a woman customer from out of town, an older woman. She didn't want to come to the store, so Charles agreed to bring them over. Now, he's due there at 9 o'clock. Mm, he's a little reckless for a man of his age, isn't he? Mm, not particularly. It's not unusual. He lives within five minutes' drive of the Blue Hills. He can carry them in a case in his inside pocket, and no one but me knows anything about it. Uh, I still don't like it. Well, you will when I tell you how I've worked it out. Let me get you a cup of coffee already. Here, Fred. Oh, what's the idea of going through my desk drawer? I'm not going through it. I'm looking for some cigarettes. Oh. Well, there's some in that box on the television stand. Okay. Here's your coffee. 
Look, Fred, this is so simple a child could do it. Charles will get to the Blue Hills about nine. He'll park on the lot. Now, there's only one attendant. You can get in the car while he's in the hotel. Hide in the back seat. I'll give you a key to the car. Oh, you got a key to his car, hmm? Yes, he forgets and locks his keys in the car every now and then when he comes over, so he had an extra one made for me. The license number is Q248Y13. It's a big blue sedan. Yeah, I know the car. I've seen it parked outside this place often enough. Well, it was your idea that I'd get the job with Charles and play up to him. Okay, okay. You know, you might have an idea at that. It's as foolproof as anything can be. Worth a try, I guess. Tomorrow night, huh? Yes. Now listen, Fred. All you have to remember... Fred reacted exactly as you hoped. And you're certain that after the holdup, Fred will be out of your life for many years at least, aren't you, Ruth? Next evening, you return home immediately after the store closes. Wait impatiently until 20 minutes before 9. Then leave your apartment. Speak pleasantly to the desk clerk in the lobby as you carefully explain you'll be back in a few minutes. You're certain Fred will do exactly as you've told him. And you know what you're going to do, too, don't you, Ruth? Yes, you know exactly what you're going to do. And you smile grimly as you enter the corner drugstore. Walk quickly to the phone booth and dial the police. Fourth Precinct Station, Sergeant Gray. There's going to be a hold-up about 9.30. Just a minute. Who's talking? It doesn't matter, and you needn't try to trace this call. I'm talking from a public phone. If you're interested, someone is planning to hold up Charles Verdon in his car at 9.30 on the parking lot of the Blue Hills Hotel. It's a blue sedan, license number Q248Y13. The hold-up man will be hiding in the car. certain that within the hour you will be well rid of Fred Markle, your former sweetheart and partner in more than one shady activity. When you return to the apartment building, you chat idly for 20 minutes or so with the desk clerk. Then take the elevator to your apartment. As you're about to turn on your radio and perhaps hear a news flash of the holdup... Fred! What's the matter, pal? You're looking at me like you're surprised I'm still around? Well, no... Come in. I'm just surprised you got back so soon. I just don't see how you had time. I didn't wait for him to park at the Blue Hills. What? I drove by his house about 8.30. His car was parked outside. What? It was dark, so I decided to take him before he went to the Blue Hills. I parked and got in the back of his car okay. In about five minutes, Burden came out, got behind the wheel. Somebody saw you? No. But your boy's got a little rough. He's a pretty big guy. It wasn't easy. And that... Well, I had to shoot him. Do you mean you killed him? Yeah, I'm afraid so. You fool. I told you not to get rough. Ferdinand's the boy that got rough. What else could I do? It was him or me. Who did you get the jewels? No, I didn't get the jewels. I barely got away as it was. What I want to know is who tipped him off. You think he was tipped off? Well, he acted like it. He had a gun. Sit down, Fred. I, I'll get you a drink. Then you can tell me all about it. Yeah, okay, I, I can use one. Here, Fred. I told you last night the cigarettes are in that box on the TV set. That desk drawer seems to fascinate you. I wasn't looking for cigarettes this time, baby. I was looking for this gun of yours. Noticed it last night when I opened this drawer. Lucky for you, it's still here. What do you mean? I mean that gun your friend Verdon was carrying tonight looked a lot like this one. Good thing it's still here. I'd have figured you tipped him off and loaned him this gun to rub me out. See, where'd you get this gun? Never told me you had a rod. Charles gave it to me. Sometimes when he went out on deals like tonight, he asked me to go with him. Bodyguard, huh? Well, it's still here, so let me have my drink. We'll forget it. Yeah. What's the matter? Your hands are shaking. Oh, why wouldn't they be shaking after what you've just done to Charles of all the stupid, unnecessary... You really thought a lot of him, didn't you? Skip it. Point is, our plans are out the window, and if you're caught, you'll be faced with a charge of murder. We'll be faced with a charge of murder. Uh, you think I'll take this rap alone, you creep? Wait a minute. That's a police siren. Coming this way. You better go, Fred. Out the back way and, and get out of town for a while. What with? You know I'm down to nothing. Well, I, I can let you have 200 here. Cashed a check today. This will take you quite a distance and keep you for a couple of weeks. But for heaven's sake, get going. All right. But I'll be back, baby, in a couple of months. Miss Walker? Yes? 
I'm Lieutenant Wilson, homicide. I'm sorry to disturb you at this hour. Well, what's wrong, Lieutenant? I'm afraid I have some bad news for you about your employer, Mr. Verdon. Mr. Verdon? Yes. I'll make it brief. There was an attempted holdup. He was killed. Oh, Mr. Verdon? Here. Well, you better sit down, Miss Walker. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, tell me, you were here all evening? Well, yes, except for about five minutes when I walked down to the drugstore. Mm -hmm. The desk clerk saw me leave and return. You may ask him if you like. Oh, no, that won't be necessary. Just a routine question. Well, I guess that's all for now. Good night, Miss Walker. Good night, Lieutenant. You feel better after the officer leaves. But you're still nervous and upset, aren't you, Ruth? You're sure Fred has left town. And you're glad he's gone. But without Charles Burton, the man you'd plan to marry or compromise, your future seems darkly uncertain. You're not even sure you'll be retained at the Burton Jewelry Company, are you? Next day, the store is closed. But the following day, you return to work. And a week later, when you enter the private office, formerly occupied by your late employer. Good morning. Oh, oh excuse me, I didn't know. Well, that's quite all right. Come on in. You're Miss Walker, aren't you? Yes, I am. I'm Bob Paxford, Mrs. Burton's nephew. Won't you sit down? Thank you. My aunt has asked me to uh, uh, sort of run the business for her, <laughs> at least for a while, until she can find someone capable of it. <laughs> I see. I wasn't very anxious to take it, but she and Uncle Charles have always been so nice to me, I thought I ought to give it a try at least. Well, I'm sure you'll do very well. Oh, I'm afraid not. Unless I get a lot of help from a lot of you people here in the store. And that brings me to the, um, um, big question. The big question? Yes. My aunt says Uncle Charles thought a great deal of you, your ability. Uh, she says he often remarked he didn't know how he got along before you became his personal secretary. Oh, well, that's nice to hear, but I'm afraid it's more than I deserve. Oh, not according to Aunt Alice. Anyway, would you mind staying on as my secretary uh, till I sort of get on to things? Why, no, I, I'll be glad to. Oh, good. Well, that's a big load off my mind. I, I'll do my best to show my appreciation. Oh, don't worry about it, Mr. Pax, but I'm glad you offered me the position. I think I'm going to enjoy working with you. Yes, you're certain of it, aren't you, Ruth? Bob Paxford is handsome, young, wealthy, and single. You're careful in everything you do and say. And within a few days, you're certain Bob is almost as impressed as was his late uncle. It isn't long until he invites you to lunch. And this is followed by an invitation to the theater. Many other dates follow. And at the end of two months, you're certain he's in love with you. That it's only a question of time until he asks you to marry him. Then late one evening, Bob parks at a quiet spot on a high cliff overlooking the sea and turns on the car radio. I'm crazy about this little spot. It's the first place we ever stopped in the park, didn't it, Bob? Yeah. That's why I'm crazy about it, I guess. I'd like to believe that. You can. That's why I parked in this particular spot this particular evening. What's so particular about this evening, Mr. Baxter? Well, I had something sort of particular to say. Something I've always been wanting to say since the first time I saw you, almost. Well? I love you, Ruth. I want you to marry me. Just like that? Just like that. No questions about who I am, my past, no boyfriends, anything? Nothing. I don't care who you were or what you did before you knew me. I don't even want to know. Well, how about it? Bob. Yes? Don't you think a gal could answer that question better if the guy who asked that? Oh, Ruth, Diane. Fred. Yeah, Fred. Told you I'd be back in a couple of months. Well, even so, you didn't have to come here. Oh, why not? Mr. Paxford's gone for the evening. I watched him drive away ten minutes ago. Hey, what a ring you're wearing. Paxford, give it to you, huh? Yes, he did. So you're going to marry him? 
No, why shouldn't I? Everything between you and me died a long time ago. Oh, relax. I don't blame you. I'm the last guy in the world to try to keep an old pal from marrying Doe. You won't believe it, but I happen to love him. Sure, I believe it. But I bet you wouldn't if he was broke, like uh, I am, for instance. What are you getting at, Fred? Oh, just a little loan for old times' sake. Nice, friendly blackmail. Hmm, how much? I'll go easy on you. Two thousand. I couldn't possibly raise that much, and you know it. Okay, I'm a reasonable guy. One thousand. Until when? Until never. Let me have a grand. You'll never hear from me again. You and Casanova can live happily ever after. And that's a promise. All right, Fred. I, I'll take your word this time. Well, now you're being smart, baby. I'm out of your hair from now on. Honest. It'll take all my savings. I'll have to pawn my necklace. But meet me at the Mid City National Bank at ten thirty in the morning. I'll have it for you. Next morning, you give Fred the $1,000. And as the weeks pass, you hear nothing further from him. Then one day, when you and Bob attend the opening day of the races. And approaching the finish line, it's a baby star by a head. Come on, baby star. Come on, baby star. And at the winner, it's baby star. Oh, 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 uh, 2280, 228 bucks. Oh, that's our fourth winner. Yeah, and I got two of those winners from a friend of mine. If you'll excuse me for a minute, honey, I think I'll go to the bar and see what he likes in the next place. Go run along. He's been a perfect picker so far. I won't be gone five minutes. Oh, yeah. The seat taken, lady? Now, these are reserved. Fred, you I know what I said, and I meant it. But I lost most of that grand in Nevada. Just let me have one more thousand, huh? You're crazy. Where do you think I'm going to get it? Well, you've been doing okay today. I've been watching Paxford collect for you. You get away from me, Fred, before you ruin everything. Call me at my apartment around 11.30 at night. No use in calling you, Ruth. I'll be there. Then come in through the rear entrance and walk up. I can't afford for you to be seen. Okay. Be seeing you. I got the answer, Ruthie. Homicide. What? Our bet in the next race. Homicide. Homicide, hmm? You know, I think that's a real hunch, darling. Homicide. Come on in, Fred. Did you come in the back way? I said I would, didn't I? You have the thousand? Yes, I have it. Good. Figured you'd decide to play it safe. I've got to play it safe, Fred. Okay, let's have it. And this is the last time, Ruth, on the level. All right, I'll get it for you, and... You're right, Fred. This is the last time. What's the idea of the gun? You'll see. Now, you stay where you are. Who are you phoning? Switchboard downstairs. The clerk's testimony will be very helpful. Yes, clerk speaking. What is it, Miss Walker? Get me the police quickly. There's a burglar in my apartment. Help me. Give me the phone. Stay away from me. Stay away from me. Miss Walker. Miss Walker, are you all right? I'm all right. But I shot the man that forced his way into my apartment. I think I killed him. Do you feel well enough to talk now, Miss Walker? Yes, Lieutenant. I'm, I'm all right. Have you ever seen this man before? Not before today. I saw him at the racetrack this afternoon. Oh? Well, uh, how did you happen to notice him? He kept looking at me. Did you have a uh, good day at the track, Miss Walker? What? Why, yes, very good. Mr. Paxford was with me. Uh-huh. This man saw you winning, followed you home. But I had dinner with Mr. Paxford after the races. It was after 11 when this man knocked on my door and forced his way in. He asked for money, didn't he? We demanded a thousand dollars. I didn't think of it before, but that's just about what I won, Lieutenant. Yeah, he spotted you with the track, all right. Well, that wraps it up. Try to get a good night's rest. Forget the whole thing. Then I've just killed a man? But you killed him in self-defense. He might have killed you, you know. Yes, but still... Forget it, Miss Walker. No one could possibly blame you for this. You haven't a thing to worry about, believe me. It was even easier than you thought it would be. The police didn't seem to doubt your story for a moment, did they? No, your timing was perfect. Phoning the desk clerk at just the right moment. Making certain he'd hear your frantic call for help. Your plea for the police. Then the shot. Now Fred Markle is out of your life forever. 
And you're certain there's nothing left to stop your marriage to wealthy Bob Paxton. You're certain, too, that the last link between you and the murder of Charles Burden has been eliminated. Late the following morning, you're having coffee in your apartment when... Oh, good morning, Lieutenant. Come in. Sit down, won't you? I, uh... I brought your gun back, Miss Walker. My gun? I didn't know you had it. I took it when I left you last night. You were probably too upset to notice. Just normal routine. I see. You, uh... Always keep this revolver in your own personal possession, do you, Miss Walker? Except when I was with Mr. Verdon when he was carrying unusually valuable jewelry. I, uh... uh, Keep it there in the desk drawer. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Incidentally, I have it to me. I know. We looked that up. Ever loan it to anyone? I never... What's this all about, Lieutenant? I'm afraid I'm going to have to charge you with murder, Miss Walker. Murder? Well, last night, you said it was self-defense. I'm not talking about last night. I'm talking about the murder of Charles Burden in that attempted hold-up a few months ago. I wasn't anywhere near there. How could you possibly... The gun you used in Fred Marker last night, your gun, Miss Walker, is the same gun that killed Charles Burden. My gun? Ballistics prove it beyond a doubt. It couldn't have been. I got... Fred. Fred who? Fred Marker. That's the man you shot last night, isn't it? Yes, but, but he's the one who killed Mr. Verdon, Lieutenant. I, I I remember now. He was at my apartment the night before Mr. Verdon was killed. He opened the desk drawer where I kept the gun looking for cigarettes. That's when he took it. It had to be. And then the night he killed Charles, he opened the drawer again and, and put it back. I know he did. Now, wait a minute. Are you saying that Fred Markle came to see you at your apartment the night before Mr. Verdon was killed and again the following night after Mr. Verdon was killed? Yes, but I can explain that. Last you night see, you said you'd never seen him before. Well, I know, but I lied. I, I, I didn't want to get mixed up in anything, but Fred had been blackmailing me. So you and... killed Marco before he could get to young Bob Paxford to tell him about you and wreck your marriage, huh? Oh, no, no. Fred threatened to kill me last night. It's no go, Miss Walker. You're under arrest. But I couldn't do it, I tell you. You'll I... have to tell that to the jury, Miss Walker. I'm afraid they'll never believe that your gun killed two different men you knew and that you were innocent in both killings. Join us again next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe presents The Whistler. This is Air Force Sergeant Don Cormay speaking. Whistler has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. This is the American Forces Network, Europe. <laughs>